All right, thanks very much for coming, everybody. Um, oh. Yeah, my name's uh, Steve Marcel. Um, I'm the MD of Cloud Jungle, and we're a Salesforce consulting partner. Um, and I uh, thought, well, first of all, I'll just check to make sure that you're in the right room. It's the croissant room. And whenever I've been to these things before, I sometimes see a session that I really want to go to and then realize, oh, no, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> and I rush out and try and catch a, another session. So I do appreciate there are some other really good sessions on at the same time. So, so thanks very much uh, for coming. But this is what we're going to cover, first of all. So um, a little bit of a, a demo of Einstein Analytics. And we're going to actually upload a, um, a CSV file and run some insights into the data. Fingers crossed. OK. Um, so from scratch, to show you how easy it is. Um, and then we're going to focus on some more sort of uh, super admin type uh, stuff um, whereby previously I think a lot of people would go and turn to use Apex triggers or code to solve some some typical issues so I've got a customer scenario which is a real live one actually and um, take you through how we how we solve those problems um, and on that page you'll see some app exchange components which I've downloaded as well to help us help us achieve that um, and the other actually even though it says admin track on the um, on, on the guide if, you, if you're a developer sometimes in, our, in my experience developers just love to jump straight into code and don't realize sometimes there are some declarative ways around some of the problems so um, and what the idea of, of, of that s section is is not to say right this is, this is a really cool thing to sort out security but just to get you thinking really is that is there another way rather than going straight to straight to code can we uh, can we solve these problems okay um, so that's if that fits great and you will stay brilliant um, <laughs> should I be in the room? Um, well, I hope so. Um, so just a quick background on me. I've, I've, um, I've gone from being a rep in, the, in, a, in a pharmaceutical company to um, sales director and marketing manager and the branding and all those sorts of things. Um, I ended up building uh, CRM solutions before Salesforce came out, um, not from a technical point of view, but from a business user. So I work with consulting firms. Um, and then... Um, and then I sold out and um, uh, set up my own telecoms uh, consultancy. Um, remember BlackBerry with a with 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 great little keyboard? So we would supply BlackBerry for, for businesses. And so in 2005, I took Salesforce on as a customer um, to, uh, to manage my sales and service. And then um, I think it was about 2013, I managed to sell that, that telecoms company, partly because all my data was so very well structured. Um, and, uh, and literally, I, went from, I sold the business within a week. Um, they thought the due diligence would take weeks and weeks, but the, the data was all there. Um, so then I ended up helping out people with Salesforce, did some, um, built some apps at Centrica, which is a, um, a uh, big energy company in the UK, they own British Gas, applications to run power stations. So not really sales and marketing, but uh, there we go. Um, safe to say I've never written a line of code because I'm not a techie, okay? Um, and um, I uh, recently joined the Salesforce Analytics Champion team. I um, also run a, um, a Salesforce implementation consultancy now. So I've got four guys, um, and the idea is that we, um, we train them all up from scratch as well. So uh, take some young guys, train them all up. Everybody's all got double qualifications at least now, and, uh, and they're all doing great. But, uh, but we don't use code in our implementations with, uh, with Salesforce customers. So um, just to talk through what we're going to do in the session, um, so we're going to upload... Um, a CSV file into analytics and see some insights into the data. Um, and then we're going to go and do that um, admin stuff, looking to see how we can overcome some sort of a typical issues um, that admins may face where they think they have to pick up the phone to uh, a developer. Um, there are any sort of um, outlines of some of the solutions I'm going to show you, and there's definitely ways to improve them. And so we can maybe have a discussion about that as well. Right, so let's get on to Einstein, and do bear with me, because I'm going to be chopping and changing screens quite a bit. Okay, so I'm going to fire up Salesforce, hopefully. Got a bit of lag going on here now. Come on. Right, okay. So um, this is um, Einstein Analytics, and um, I'm going to just go straight into, because it takes a, a minute or two, I'm going to go straight and upload a data set from a CSV file. I'll talk about these other, other, um, other bits and bobs in a minute. And um, the data set I'm going to open up is kind of an open source data that I just downloaded the other day off the internet. And it's um, TripAdvisor reviews um, looking at restaurants across Europe. So, um, and I'll show you a bit more about the file in a minute. But that's uploading about, um, about 35,000 TripAdvisor reviews of restaurants across Europe at the moment. Okay. So I'll just show you a little bit about the data there. 
So this is the actual data uh, that we're uploading. Okay. And um, so it's got the name of the restaurant, which is actually not really relevant to us, because what we want to do is we want to find out what's the best city to go to for, for good food. Okay. Um, and what we've done here, I've just built some custom columns in Excel to look at the cuisine field that we downloaded to see if it contained French, obviously, <laughs> uh, Italian seafood, um, Asian. So you, you, can, you, can, you can chop and change this, but it's basically querying the, uh, um, the list of food on offer. Um, the data set is initially too large for this sort of, sort of demo org, so I cut it down a bit by only selecting ones that also had vegetarian options. You'll see everyone's got, got a V in there as well. So, so we can see the, importantly see the city and we can see the TripAdvisor rating. Okay, we could look at a lot more fields as well. Um, that would clearly sort of slow things down. So that's sort of the, the story behind the data. So if we go back to um, uh, analytics, and there we go. It's update, uploaded Eurofood. Okay, so it's uploaded those, that CSV into analytics. And um, so I'm just going just to hit the create story now. And it could take me through a wizard. And what I want to do is I want to maximize the rating, so the TripAdvisor rating. Okay, um, um, the story's called Eurofood, and then I can look at my data options. And here you can select what you want Einstein to look at in terms of when it's uh, um, querying the, uh, the data. And as we said before, actually the name of the restaurant's not important to me because I want to know more about the city. And I think it's everything else. Oh, Cuisine Star, that was that big horrible field. We're going to chop that out because I've actually... Um, rather than look at that big field, I've just selected um, a few few variations, so Italian, French, seafood, etc. So that's that's the premises I want to look at on um, my data. So I'm now I'm going to set Einstein to uh, to run. So it takes about a minute or so to run. Has anybody done this before? Has anybody run a discovery story? No. Okay. So you can all do it. Um, and so basically, this org here was one that I um, downloaded when I was doing a um, Einstein Analytics Super Badge. So if you want to play around with analytics, go and do the super badge, you get the org, and it's, uh, uh, it's really good. The data set come from a, a website called Kaggle. I think there's quite a few of them, and you can, there's all sorts of um, uh, data you can download. I was looking at one, looking at heart disease to maybe demo, um, but it all got a little bit medical, and I thought, actually, where's the best place to go and eat? And probably we could all, all relate to that anyway. So, um, so yeah, so Einstein's crunching its um, numbers now, and what it's going to do it's going gonna, it's gonna to look at the cities, it's going to look at the average ratings. In there, there was a price column as well. I forgot to mention the price column. So you can see whether the, the food in the restaurant is, is I've, I've, I'd separate it to be high, medium, or low cost. And then, uh, and then we can then hopefully pick up some trends. We're nearly done. Come on, Einstein. This is where you cross your fingers, right? That, you know, the, the live demo works. OK, so it looks like he's pretty much done. Cool. There we go. And so that's all of the, the data crunched. And now this gives us some early insights into the data. And we can see Bratislava is the best place to go for good food. Okay. So this is looking at the average rating across all the cities. Let's not go to Milan. That's not, not looking so good. Okay. But we look at Bratislava, Bratislava it, was the, it was the best. But actually, the result would be improved if seafood was false. So if you don't go to a seafood food restaurant in Bratislava, it's going to be even better. Yeah. Um, and Athens was, was uh, really high as well. Um, and um, again, if, if you don't go to an Italian, that looks like it's a, a good thing. All right. Um, Milan was worse. And if you do go to a medium price restaurant in Milan, it's going to be really bad. OK. So, um, so this is just like a top overview. And then, and then the actual data just goes down and looks at lots and lots of the um, uh, of different parameters. So, i.e., when seafood is true, so Edinburgh and London go, come out pretty well. And there's other things that then help um, or hinder that um, uh, th those results. Okay. And now this is this is where we're really interested in. It's like where we can get really food cheaply. So <laughs> let's go to Athens, um, when the price is low and the city is Athens. That seems to be um, uh, really good. And as we saw before, we need to avoid the Italian food in in, Asin, in Athens. So that's sort of what's, what's happened. But if we want to get a little bit more behind the detail of that, we can click over here to, to why it's happened. Um, and literally, I'm just blagging this because we've just uploaded this for, for the first time, effectively. Um, but so this city is Athens. And all these green things here are positive indicators. Okay, So we can see um, um, 
Italian is, uh, it now, Italian is false because 75% of the time, so 75% of the restaurants don't do Italian food. Um, but it changes 92% when it's known that city is Athens. So obviously they don't do many Athens. Because of this, the rating increases. So obviously Italian food is getting a bit of a bad reviews generally on, on, on TripAdvisor. Okay. So, and all the, the red things here, these are negative effectors affecting the view of, of what's going on in Athens at the moment. Okay. Um, and likewise, if you look at the Bratislava, um, Milan, so we're obviously going to avoid this place for, for foodies. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So just give you a bit of insight into that. And when you get the hang of these graphs and how they work, and then you can just sort of hover over a section and gives you some really insight, good insight, it really helps you get to understand the data. Okay. So then we've got this predictions and improvements uh, area, and you can actually do some, um, you can do some, do some comparisons. So we could, we could do uh, London, and uh, should we do Paris? Okay, and so we can we, we can compare the difference between the food in London and Paris. And there we go, just a few clicks, and it's telling us uh, where Paris outperforms London. And for, oh look, fortunately, French food is better in Paris than in London. That is a relief. <laughs> okay, so that just gives you a bit of insight in, in, into that. Okay, um, just lastly, to show this this updates here, it's just noted a few outliers in our data, so we could actually just get rid of those outliers there. And also, it's also making some recommendations for us. It says, you know, 94% of your entries don't do French food. So you, you could actually remove that because it's, it's not really adding much to the data analysis. And the same for seafood as well. Okay. So that's just a really quick overview of Einstein Analytics. Just go and get, get an org from, from Trailhead and just have a play with the data. And you get some incredible insights. And, and then think of the... Um, the applications for your, you know, for well, certainly for our customers, is, uh, is going to be can be great. We, we're doing some big work with telecoms infrastructure at the moment, and they're going to be able to project, predict whether projects are going to finish on time and what the sticking points uh, might be. And um, but yeah, but that will just just from a few clicks and a bit of CSV. Obviously, you can connect up to Salesforce objects, and it can refresh regularly, and the and the and the, st and the story can can generate, and you can then model this data and then make predictions in your Salesforce records as well. Okay, so let's um, so that's that. So definitely have a look at analytics. Now I want to um, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. I told you I was going to be all over the place. Okay, and we've done that. Right. Okay, power of the platform. Okay, so so this is a um, actual cluster of mine. Um, they're a traffic management company. So they they close roads. They put two-way lights up. Set up diversions. All those sorts of things, okay? So we all love those guys. I'm sure they're out in force when I came from the airport yesterday. Um, and um, so their issue was they're very specific about what they want. So the so way we've architected their org is so they've got a custom object called job, okay? And the job is, contains all the headlines of the job, and they have to book in the job with the local council to get approval to close the road. It's where they generate their quotes for the customer. So they've got some sort of sensitive data on there. Then they also have shifts, and shifts is going to be a child of job because a, a job closing road might go on for two weeks, three weeks, whatever, and they have to man, um, uh, pe put people out there to shut the road each day perhaps or set the lights up or check the batteries. Um, so, and what happened is, is we mobilised th this app. So, so the operatives, there's 150 guys um, who are out with the cones, they've all now got um, smartphones so they can see a list, list of their shifts on their, on their phone and update the fists shifts and use Jean-Michel's app to take photographs of what's going on. So it's, it's all pretty cool. But, but in the office, they said, look, the, the guys out on the road can't see details of the job. We don't want them to see it. And we only want to see them, them to see their shifts and no other shifts. Um, and so previously, we had a master detail relationship between job and shifts. It sounds pretty sensible, right? Um, but we couldn't do that because of the sharing settings. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about, about that. Uh, Where's my Chrome gone? Okay. So, um, yeah, so in the sharing settings, um, we've, uh, so what we've done is we've got job and we set it to private. Now, if this is master detail, obviously shifts over here would just inherit the um, security from the parent, okay? But we've got that as private as well, so they both, they both need to be private, okay? So 
So we have a job here, okay, and it's got one shift with, uh, with Laura. Okay, and if we're going to make a new shift now, okay, obviously we've stripped out all the other stuff, but we're going to assign this to Luke. Now, this is a private sharing model, and I'm going to open up the shift for Luke, okay? And up here, I've got a little component that I've downloaded from the, uh, from the App Exchange. If you remember, if those of you used Classic, there was a nice little sharing button which can tell you who's actually um, uh, got access to the record. So if I click on that, that component's going to uh, fire up. And you can see it's, uh, it's got me here as the owner of the record, but now it's also shared it with Luke as well. Okay, so if we go back and then we're going to look at the other job, which is Laura's job, then, okay, we should look at that shift and it should be shared with Laura. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Um, now, so how do we do that? So we use Process Builder, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So basically, when a user is populated on a on a record, on a shift record, it fires the share, share shift flow. Careful how I say that. Okay, so, and um, uh, we're gonna do our shift sharing flow here. So this is just, has everybody done flows? Familiar, no? Has anybody, any, has anybody not touched them? You're allowed to go, great. So this is really, a really, really simple flow look and we probably would make it real more, a little bit more complicated in the real world. But basically, it's, um, it's taking the... Um, uh, when, when, you, when you create that, that shift, it's taking the ID of the shift, and when you make a record private in Salesforce, it creates a new object called object share. So here, is, so Salesforce created the shift share object um, um, when we set it to private. And all it's doing is giving edit access to the to the shift to the user that you pass in through the process builder, and it's just created. A, so it's as simple as that. And so previously, you may well have gone to do some sort of Apex stuff to, to do that because it's not the sort of thing you'd use a, not a standard sharing rule with within Salesforce. Okay, so that's sort of one example there. Let's go back to our um, let's go back to our job. And you can see here as well, we're counting the number of shifts. It's not master detail. So again, we're using a flow to do that. Every time a shift is changed, we're going to do a little lookup, see how many shifts there are on, on that um, job, and count them, and then populate that field. Um, so the other thing we're going to do now is um, um, if we delete the job, they're no longer linked by a master detail, but we want to delete all the shifts as well. Okay, so this was a specific requirement. And we've done that with an action. Okay, so we'll just demonstrate that now. So, um, in fact, let me go into the object first of all, and I'll show you the button in the background. There's two ways of doing it. There's one Visual Force way as well, but maybe that's code, I don't know. But this definitely isn't. Okay, so basically it's calling this, um, this button is calling a flow called del delete job flow. Okay, I'm just going to open that up, and then some of you go, might go, oh, hang on a minute, you can't just go and delete a job without a screen element. So we just put a screen element in there. So basically what it's going to do is going to pass the idea of the, of the job in there, and the, well, the first thing it's going to say, are you sure you want to delete? Yeah, and then and you're going to go yes, and then it's going to get the idea of the record, okay, or find the record rather, and then it's going to say, has it got any shifts associated with it? So it's going to count, it's going to look up the, um, uh, the shift record with the where the, the job ID is that is obviously the parent. If it's found some shifts, um, it's going to delete the shifts first and then the job and then a, a success screen at the end. So we can just see that in action now. So it's literally delete the job. It's going to fly up the flow. This is our screen element. Click next, delete the job and the shifts. Oh, no, the image is not available. Okay, but that was our... It was supposed to be a thumbs up. I'm not sure why it hasn't worked. Okay, and then... Um, and then we yeah, and then we then we then we can finish. Oh, I should have got what I should have done is gone to the link which took you back to where I'm supposed to be going. So let's just delete another one and I'll show you how that should work. Can't promise we'll get the uh, the image up. Yeah, and if I click here, then it's going to take me back to my job list. Okay. So yeah, it's just a little workaround about how you can um, 
maybe not use code to do those sorts of things. So I'd encourage you to think about and look at these workarounds. And I learned all this just from the success community. Um, can you can you do this with, without code? And, and then uh, there's there's plenty of information out there. Okay. I think that's my five minutes. Eh? Great. Okay. I was going to show you all that, but I haven't done it. Okay. So we've done all this. Done that. Right. Okay. So um, there are. Let me show you the, the roll-up summary flow actually very quickly. There's a problem with it. So this is telling me I've got two two shifts, okay, and um, but if I um, if I go into this shift here and I delete this shift, yeah, the job is still saying I've got two shifts. So so because my 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 flow is very very simple. It just said um, um, bef before it said if there's a change being made to the shift, then uh, we're going to delete that shift. It's going to pass through the ID. Um, we're going to sort of re-add up the shift, not, not delete the shift, but if the change is made to a shift, it would just go and check to see how many shifts you've got for that job and populate the number of shifts. So anybody got any ideas how we could sort of fix that problem? No? Okay. So there's a, there's a bit of clue is that it was over here. Is we could actually use another action again. So we could actually um, override our delete button on shift. We could hide it and put a new button on there. And actually, if you hit delete, the, the first thing it would do would count how many existing shifts there are. Yeah, and it's got, to, it had two. So we take one off that. So we got one left. Then we, then we would do the thing to delete the shift through the flow. And then we would then go and update the, the new number of shifts. Yeah, so there's lots of, a few different various ways we could do it. So that's a, the that's a sort of thing uh, um, we can do. And the other thing with, that we would also do um, with um, the flow that I showed with the sharing, it was just a simple one object thing. Anybody see any problems with that at all? The shift share issue. If I decided to change the operative that was going out there, yeah, it would assign the, the shift to the new operative, but it wouldn't take it off the last one. So again, I would put another couple of steps in my flow to go and check to see if there's anybody else, and if they are, take them off and make sure I've got the new person on. And so just give you a little... Um, so this is what it actually looks like in the <laughs> in the real org. So the flows can get can get pretty big. So this is um this is basically a whole shift scheduling um, scenario going on here um, with flows, um, and what this does is actually it looks at the um, looks at the job, works out what traffic management is required, whether it's traffic lights or um, or, or, or diversions, etc. It actually looks at the time of day um, that it is. Um, and it also looks to see whether it's a weekend or not, because some shifts we've got like a little button to say admit weekends, some are weekends only. And what this will do, it will actually schedule and create shifts from the start of the job to the end of the job. Okay, so just at a click of a button, we've, got, we've got, literally got a checkbox on the job saying um, uh, create job, uh, and, and sorry, create schedule, and it'll like, create all the shifts for the future for that. Okay, and then uh, so that's kind of the power of flows and and, uh, and why you perhaps you don't need uh, Apex. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, you can, you can call a flow from a flow. Yeah. The guy's in the office now, so my uh, guys that we've trained up, because the new, that is a new flow builder. I've not used it that much, because they're doing more of the, the work than I am these days. And, um, but, um, yeah, they're getting really good at flows and also record choice sets as well. That's a new thing in flows. So you can actually, you know, actually query a list of values. So on an object, if you've got, I don't know, if you've got, if you've got an object with five records with five different names and you w would want to go and select them, and actually it would go and look at the names and present them as a, like a, a radio button. So you can go which, which, or which, like if, let's say if you're selecting products for something, which product do you want to select? So it's very, very powerful um, now flows and, uh, and obviously, we all know the movement is going to clicks not cl clicks not code, but they're really giving us the tools uh, to do that. So, yeah, no, absolutely, definitely um, have a play with a new flow builder if you've uh, if you've not got stuck into it. It's, uh, it is uh, is really cool. It's pretty intuitive. There's lots of online help as well. Any other questions? Yeah, Go on. Yeah. Yeah. What would, what would be the next best admin step? 
I would I would say so um, we've had this discussion this week in the office so just in your mind just think about all the steps that you would need to take and then just write them down um, uh, find the core bit first of all so for example the shift share bit that I did is like the first thing we want to do is share that shift and then you see so you build that part of the flow and you test it and it works and it's great and then you as you test it you go oh yeah but if I change the operative then it's going to add another sharer so what do I need to do well I need to go and do a look up to look up um, if there's any other shifts or, or, or the previous, in fact, the way you would do it is, is when the operative has changed, you would set a flow and you, you send in the previous ID as well. So and then you would go and look up the shift share record with that shift ID and that previous ID of the user, find that record, delete that, and then create the new one. So it's just, just think in a very logical sequence. And, and that big flow that you saw before actually started a lot smaller. And then the client kept on saying, oh, yeah, can we just do it so we can admit weekends and then you think well how are we going to do that so we have a formula to work out what day it is there's a counter in there as well as so you've got your start date of the first of the month for example creates the shift adds one to the counter so it's the second of the month and then it says is that what day is that there's a formula to work out the day is, is it is it saturday uh no okay that means we can we can create the shift or if it is we'll, we'll skip it and go to the next day so it's just a very very logical sort of um mindset and you can uh, you can come with really Massive flows, but they're, they're they're super powerful. And just just lastly, we've got a client that does um, uh, bio uh, biotechnology or uh, biotech testing. So they test for Salmonella and Legionella, etc. And their clients will give them maybe twenty samples of water to, te to test. And um, and depending on what they're testing, they each sample could have like several different tests. So we built a Salesforce solution to do all the testing, gives them all the results. It's you know it's pretty incredible. But actually we've and but the the people booking in the samples, let's let's say they weren't very intelligent, okay, to say the least. But they're like, no, 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 we just want to be able to go six six samples and this test and that test and for it to do all the work for us. And we think, oh yeah, I bet you do. But then we go away and we think about it, and it's right. You, you can do that, and so we broke it all down. And, and literally, whether they book in a job now, it takes them through the flow. How many samples have you got? Um, how many different types of tests have you got? And in fact, which test suite are you going to use in terms of which is using your record choice sets? And um, so we break it all down, and um, and literally they just answer a few questions, and they from a couple of clicks they can create like fifty tests. And so then it goes into the lab and they've got all their tests that they then need to do and populate. And then obviously they've then got tools to mass update test results, et cetera, to really streamline the operation. So, yeah, it's just really is breaking everything down bit by bit and, uh, and keep on challenging yourself as well to go, yeah, what, how, how can I do this? And you can actually produce some incredible workflows. Anything else? No? Okay, well, thanks very much for listening. So... Um, Hopefully you might be able to catch the end of the uh, Einstein keynote or perhaps go to another one. Thank you, guys.